Good day, viewers. Welcome to another edition of 30 Minutes, the interactive program of Trust Television. I'm Manir Dan Ali. My guest today started out as a journalist, but is now into policy. I'm talking of Waziri Adio, who is the executive director of Agora Policy, a think tank based here in Abuja. Before that, in his other life, he was also the chief executive of Naiti, that is the body that is concerned with the extractive industry, uh, like being a watchdog there. Uh, Waziri, welcome to this program. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for having me. You uh, started this new policy body. There aren't many think tanks in Nigeria, that is bodies that are supposed to be uh, studying certain aspects of the society, issuing reports, advisories, and what have you. Is it your um, experience in NAITI, that's the Nigerian Extractive Industry Initiative, that informed the decision to now go into this area? Thank you again for having me. Uh, I will say yes and no. Um, and I will say that on the basis of the fact that, you know, uh, the, 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 you need to have policies that are appropriate for the societies, uh, for different societies. And you need to have people all the time who will be thinking about how to come up with solutions uh, to depressing problems in societies. Um, we don't do that enough in this country. We don't do enough of that. Uh, all of us, including people who are in government. All of us like to complain. Um, all of us like to analyze issues. Sometimes we do analysis to death. We engage in analysis paralysis. Mm. Uh, but we need more than that. You start with the analysis, uh, but you also need to come up with options. Solutions. And solutions right. right. And options and solutions based on evidence. And also, to go back to, to, to step back a little bit, the analysis in most instances, they are not driven by evidence, they are not driven by facts. They are mostly driven by emotions, ideological leanings, preferences. There's nothing wrong with all of those things. But the societies that have made progress, uh, there are societies that have used evidence to formulate policies, to review policies, to implement policies. Uh, and, you know, in terms of policies, right, it's not only government people that should be doing this. Yes, they have the primary responsibility for it, but you also have people in the academia, you have people in civil society, you have even people in the media who should be part of this policy making process. You know, so the, is where, that's the business of ideas. When you go to a place like uh, Washington, for example, you have hundreds of think tanks. And that is a society where they are far, far, far ahead of us. And so, they are still thinking, are still thinking of new, solutions, new solutions, analyzing situations, ab absolutely, and absolutely, creating scenarios. Absolutely. That is, you know, you need to rule societies by ideas. You need to have, and the ideas will have a gestation period, right? It doesn't mean that because you come up with an idea today, there will be somebody who will have need for it, or there will be somebody that, that, that believes in it, right? But at some point, people will be looking for ideas, and they can't find ideas. So you need to have... Yes, to go back to your question, in Nigeria we have think tanks, but you can't have enough. We need more, not less. I just mentioned Washington now, which is like the headquarters of, of think tanks in the world. So when you go to the UK, when you go to many other countries, you see a surfeit of think tanks. Of, they call think tanks the incubators of ideas. You know, they're always thinking about different ways to solve problems. Not to talk of a country like our own, where we have persistent, lingering, you know, uh, problems, and we need solutions. Um, but, but isn't it a problem that in spite of these persistent lingering problems, those who ought to act do not even listen or read their own reports as the government? I mean, a lot of reports are yeah. there in government that are, they are more or less gathering dust. Of recent, there's the conferences, the political conferences, yeah. there's the OAS report, there are reports on police reforms, there are reports on almost every subject under the sun, and it's just kept there. So okay. isn't that a kind of disappointment to people like you who want to 
like think some more and offer more solutions? Not necessarily. If you if you are familiar with the policy process, right? Um, you have a long-term view of things. And that is what will keep you going so that you will not be disappointed, so that you will not be disillusioned. Um, like I said, ideas have a gestation period. Then if you look at the policy process, there's the process, there's the stage where you put an idea on the, on the top of the mind of policymakers, right? Um, there's, a, there's, a pro, there's a stage where they talk about designing, accepting the ideas. The idea, right? The fact that an idea is there doesn't mean that it is accepted. And it doesn't mean that because an idea is good, automatically it will be accepted. There's a stage where they, now they've embraced the idea, they've now designed the policy. Then they will implement. Then they will review to make sure that the implementation is going on, monitor and evaluation. Then you need to sustain it. So it's a long process. So um, what you need to do as somebody who's a policy actor or somebody interested in policy is to say, where are we in the policy process and what work needs to be done. And where right. exactly are you? Where have you found yourself to be? Well, what, what, what we've tried to do now is to say, you know, as um, in Agora, okay, before I answer that question, um, as also somebody who has been in government, I will also share this. You have the, that the, advantage. The, yeah, the, the, the thing is that when people in government have not done something or have not acted on something, it's not necessarily because they are clueless, it's not necessarily because they are evil, it's not necessarily because they are incompetent or because they don't mean well, right? There are so many variables, there are so many moving parts, right? And that is why the people who are in the business of policy engagement, they also need to have skills for engaging. The fact that you are interested in an idea uh, and there's no traction on it doesn't mean that you should give up. You need to continue, you need to know how to engage and you need to continue to uh, find ways and of engaging. even so, who to engage, yeah, yeah. probably. So, so sometimes you also need to do your uh, uh, political analysis, uh, political economy analysis to say, who are the people that should be interested in this issue? What are their interests? And when you are saying their interests, you are not talking about what comes to their pocket, right? What is the, what is the thing that is important to them? How does this issue connect to what is important to them? Which will inform how you frame it to them, what you say to them, and what part of it they will find palatable, right? So it's a lot of work. So but you know, what people in civil society and the larger society you know, uh, do is that they believe passionately in something, which is, which is OK. And they believe that the other people should see it that way. People have constraints. So what, one of the things I try to do in terms of policy work before I come to this Agora thing is that even as when I was working in Haiti, I said, OK, we're a government organization that, that is charged with serving as a watchdog uh, on other government organizations in the extractive sector and also the private sector. But you find out that the organization will, will make recommendations that will not be implemented. Right. And there are some people who believe that, oh, you know, what you need to do is that just name and shame them, right? Make a lot of noise about all these things, mm. you know, and, you know, they will be ashamed. You know, but, and probably and, it won't change but, much. Yeah, but, but you also see that that didn't work. And you ask, okay, why don't we do it this way? Why don't we go beyond just naming and shaming and just being sensational and take the issues one after the other and do an in-depth report, right? For example, if you say, oh, um, um, oil theft, for example, you can say, what is the quantum of this oil theft? What's the cost? What are the different things that government has tried to do over time? Why is it not working? And what should be done by who? and how. So what you are doing is that you're actually multiplying options for government. So that when they're actually, um, uh, and you, you don't leave it at that. You don't mm -hmm. just say, okay, we have published this report, you put it in the press. You also say, so who has the responsibility? Who has the responsibility? Who has the purchase to act on this issue? And you reach out directly to them. Because some of the things, especially people who have media background, one of the, some of the um, so civil society people, and even people who are politically minded, what they usually think about is that because you have put something in the media, does it that yeah. people have read it, and because they've read it or because they've seen it, they are convinced. Yes, you know the media is a very powerful, you know, a channel of communication. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, when you sit down with someone mm -hmm. and you explain it to them, and you explain it to them in a way that resonates with them. And you give them options. 
So, for example, if a government is, is, is um, even if they don't want to solve the problem of oil theft because of you know, certain reasons, but you are thinking that these guys need money. And I want to frame this issue in such a way that because you are cash trapped, right, if you solve this problem, you have more money. So it's a very creative way of putting yes, it to yes. the officials so, so, the, the, so they can see it's the, a win-win. The, the people who, have, who are interested in ideas, who are interested in issues, they also need to have skills for engaging. There's, there's a time when you march, there's a time when you shout, there's a time when you sit down and, you know, like you said, create a win-win in the way you frame the issue. You know, get them invested in it. Let me give you an, an example uh, of one of the things we did in Haiti. Uh, everybody used to say, oh, there's this act that should have been amended. If this act had been amended, the country would have made a lot of money and all of that, or the country lost a lot of money because that act was not there's amended. The petroleum uh, not industry. even the petroleum okay. industry act. Right. There's this deep offshore okay, right. uh, 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 act, right? Uh, deep offshore. Uh, uh, um, I will remember the name now, Deep Offshore, uh, anyway, it's about, yes, it's about it's exploration yeah. in the uh, Deep Offshore. Deep, deep Offshore uh, production sharing contract. Right, right? PSC. The PSCs. The law should have been amended. It wasn't amended. And on account of that, the country lost a lot of money. And you see high-ranking people will be saying the country lost a lot of money. The country lost a lot of These are the people who should act. Just lamenting and yes. not And you're now saying, acting. come. What is the amount of money that doesn't have a name? So let's calculate the time when it should have been amended, and let's use some benchmark to do the calculation, and on the basis of that, come up with a figure of the loss. So that when you see that, oh, the country lost between 17 billion and 28 billion for not amending its own act, the way it was stipulated in the same act, right? And mm -hmm. you now do an opportunity cost of that loss. He said, this money that you have lost, look at what it could have got you. Right. If you had devoted the money to all mm. of this. And on the basis of that, you now say, okay, these are the things you can do. So anyway, we did this modeling. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, then we sent it, sent it to the president, we sent it to, the, uh, to the, the chief of staff, to the president, sent it to the vice president, we sent it to diff the people who have the responsibility to act. And they called us and they said, we want to see this your model. And we sent the model to them. And they looked at it. Then, before you know it, they initiated a, a, a review, and they got it done. I don't think they got it done because, not just because of the evidence we have provided, right, but because they are also looking for money. So, you know, so it's about how do you create value for them, the things that are important to them, that are also important to you, why do you frame this issue in such a way that we they, they will embrace it? If I can jump in there, yeah. do you reckon then that uh, going by what you've just said, probably is the economic squeeze in the country that is forcing Nigeria to take notice of the massive oil theft that has been going on for a long time that seems to have only gotten worse of recent? Yeah, that's part of the reason, uh, as you know, uh, where, where, where this is a time when we should be making a lot of money from oil. Why? Because we have historic high level, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, price of oil, yes. right? Much higher than what we budgeted for, much higher than what anybody expected. When the budget was passed last year, nobody knew that Ukraine was going to happen, right? The budget benchmark was $73 per barrel. And at some point, oil went beyond fifty, uh, one hundred uh, twenty yes. uh, dollars per barrel, right? So we should be making a lot of money, but we aren't. But we are not. Why? Because we can, we could not meet our OPEC quota, and also because of the theft. Yeah, and we are not meeting the OPEC quota because one, the theft, but there are also also some other things we had. Because of many things that we did, there's a lot. There was a lot of underinvestment. Investment, yes. That also limited. At the production, then you know, oil production is also quite uh, tricky. You know, don't forget that uh, during COVID 2020, during COVID, most of these uh, companies uh, shut down because the price of oil was very low, and because the whole world shut down, right? Demand was uh, very low. Mm. So because of that, you know, they shut down, and the cost of restarting will also have impact. So there are many reasons why our production, 
has reduced. But we'll you know, get to all those reasons yeah. and more. Actually, I want us to take a deep dive even into your reports when we yeah. resume from this short break. Welcome back. It is still 30 minutes, the interactive program of Trust Television. Before we went on break, we were talking about the oil theft, mm -hmm. its uh, implication for Nigeria, the fact that Nigeria is being cited all over the world as the one oil producing country that couldn't make hay when the sun was shining. That's regarding high oil prices. And now they are coming down. Mm. And are we fixing the problem of the oil theft? Because there have been so much uh, noise about it, including the engagement of Tom Polo, a well-known former militant, who is now suddenly discovering so many things that have been in plain sight. Mm. Well, uh, the, the, at least uh, that has got our attention, right? And people are acting on it, right? If, uh, you know, if we had been producing like 2.5 million barrels per day uh, and we're losing like 300,000 barrels per day, we'll still be fine. Uh, but we're producing a little over 1 million barrels per day. Um, and by the way, what we are producing doesn't mean, that production figure does not mean that everything goes to the government. Um, the companies take their share, government takes its share. Presently, government takes about 30% of the total production, right? So um, oil theft has reduced the quantum of production, which will in turn reduce the share that government will get. But there's another problem. The other problem is that the production that we, the total government take now most, all, almost all of it is used to import uh, refined, refined products. products, right? And that refined product is being sold at a discount, which means subsidized, right? So what it means is that the money we should be making from, uh, the, uh, from crude oil is not just that we're not making as much as we should be making. We're not making at all in terms of crude sales. Because whatever little we are making, because what we you are make, using it to... You use it, subsidy takes it. And that brings us to one of your own recommendations, that yeah. is the Agora uh, policy think tank. Yeah. You are recommending this hard pill that has been so difficult to swallow for different governments. Mm. Many thought the Buhari government could do it. It has blanched. It's now pushed it to the next government. Do you reckon that suggestion of yours that the subsidy must be stopped could happen as soon as we finish election next year? I mean, when the new government, a new government will come and take that kind of very unpopular decision. Okay, let, let's take it one after the other. Uh, the first one is that you said many governments have had problems with um, removing forest subsidy. Not forest subsidy, petrol subsidy, because fuel is so many things, you know. Um, the assumption is that people will revote, and government doesn't want people to revote, right? Which is legitimate. Um, and most governments will tell you that this will hurt the poor if we remove it, which is also true to a large extent, and I'll come back to that, also tied to our recommendation. But the fact of the matter is that petrol subsidy, if we do not deal with it, is going to deal with us. If we do not, it's going to kill us, actually. Uh, let me give you an example. This year, between January and June, we expended 1.5 trillion naira on petrol subsidy. If you take how much we budgeted for poverty reduction and social transfer, that's under 500 billion. What we budgeted for health, um, that's under 700 billion. Or budgeted for education, a little over um, um, uh, 800 billion. What we budgeted for capital, infrastructure, about also below what we spent. Mm. That's for a year. And this has been I, spent in just a few months on the subsidy. Six months on petrol subsidy alone. Uh, if you look at it, um, is it benefiting the poor? There's enough evidence that shows that the people who benefit most from first subsidy from petrol subsidy are the rich people. There's enough evidence about that, right? So, but if you remove it, 
is also, it doesn't mean that because the poor do not benefit from it, it doesn't mean that they will not be affected by the removal. Because there will be automatic increases in prices, yes, not just that, the, and the, all the, sorts the, of the, products. The, the, the things that will be affected, like transportation that you mentioned, like food prices, they are the things that the poor people spend most of their income on. Let me give you an example. If somebody earns 20,000 Naira per month, and they live in Yaya, and they work in the city center, the bulk of their income will be going on transportation. Whereas if somebody earns 10 million per month, no matter what happens, is a, is a significant portion of their income that they are spending on transportation and on food, right? So the poor will be disproportionately affected. And that is why in our report, we recommended that this should go, right? But that money should, part of it, should, a number of things should happen. Part of that money should be invested in things that will benefit the poor. Right? But you know, even those that, things that, that, are controversial sometimes. Yeah. Look at what the humanitarian ministry was saying, all the billions it spent feeding school children under COVID that is claiming to go to their houses and feed them. Okay, so, so there are many issues around, around petrol subsidy. One is, even when you, government is not explaining enough, right? Uh, when you look at um, our budgets, first subsidy we need to go. There's no, no we, shouldn't, we shouldn't have any illusion about that. But do, do, do that. you think the politicians will have the gumption to do yeah, it? Yeah, the thing now is that, so how should they, how will they go about it? But let me explain why it should go. I understand uh, why it should the, go. The, no, let's even look at the, the quantum of money in the 2023 budget proposal. They said they are going to spend 3.36 trillion on first subsidy for six months which means for a petrol subsidy, I keep saying for a subsidy, yes. petrol subsidy, which means every month they will spend 500 billion naira on petrol subsidy alone. Most of this captured by the rich, most of this we're using to subsidize other countries. Because even the numbers, the consumption figures you can't seem control artificially the high. You can't. My brother, if they are selling fuel, uh, 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 140 65. something, 165 in Nigeria, and they are selling it uh, uh, 300 in uh, in uh, Benin Republic. And I'm sure you are familiar with this. In some parts of Lagos, this is Nigeria, this is Benin yeah. Republic. It's like that in Niger, in the north too. You understand? So there's nothing you can do. You let's know? let's move yeah. from the fuel issue. You've made the point very no, but, clear. But the, but what the point, about the, what about the, sorry, the issue let, of uh, the debt, because one of your recommendations yeah. about the debt is unsustainable yeah. and it's evident 2023 yeah. uh, budget is going to be all on borrowing more than yeah. 10 trillion yeah. Yeah. to be borrowed yeah. from local yeah. sources and yeah. Yeah. external so, so ones. Let me, let me just finish this part on the petrol subsidy, right? To do it effectively, we need to have honest conversation with ourselves. Government needs to calm down from his high horse and communicate with the people and build trust. You mentioned you, you saw certain things, you know, all these controversies are on the basis of people do not trust government. And those, let's, let's look at something, you know, and I'm sure, you know, many people will remember this. Under Abacha, they increased fuel prices. Part of the gains, they created an entity called PTF. And they, asked the petroleum trust fund, and they asked the present president to head it. But because he was a credible person, there are still parts of Nigeria you go to today that you see what PTF did, right? So it can be done. You need to build trust. You need to acknowledge that the poor will suffer and we need to, to take care of the areas in which they're going to suffer, right? But then you how, know, do you, how do you deal with the big appetite for debt, especially yes. by this government? Because your report is showing in some areas up to 7,000% yeah. increase. So, so one of the things that the government has been saying is that our debt is sustainable. And Do you this, agree this, with that? This, no, uh, we don't think so, for a number of reasons. Uh, the first thing is that what they usually use to give themselves that comfort, you know, first, you know, sense of um, things are going, they are not out of work, uh, is that they use debt to GDP. And right? GDP is not yes. production, it's not yeah, yeah. actual GD, GDP, GDP is your total production, right? as opposed to revenue, right? So it's not the GDP that will pay the debt. 
it's government revenue that you use to pay the debt. And if you cast your mind back, the first four months of this year, the entire revenue that we had was not enough to service debt. So it's clearly something... So that means we just have to keep... Yes. In the short run, and, and, we have to keep taking and, these and, debts. And, and, and the more that you take, the more you take, the bigger your debt, and the more you need to service the debt in the future. Let me, let me, and that let was where probably even the finance minister was talking of restructuring, though she beat a retreat yeah, on it. Yeah, I, I, I will explain that. You know, but, but when you look at it, even the proposed 2023 budget that you mentioned, right, they're going to use 6.5 trillion for debt service. They have two areas for debt service. They have debt service, they have the sinking fund. The two of them, 6.5 trillion, right? If you add what you want to spend on petrol subsidy, 3.3 trillion so that that is um that's um uh yeah that's uh eight point um uh, that's nine point nine nine yeah that's nine point eight trillion already right for two items debt service petrol subsidy the entire revenue that were that we projected that will come to government is nine point seven trillion so the revenue will not be enough for debt service and petrol subsidy alone which means salaries Overhead, capital will be borrowed. So it's like, it's a vicious circle. It has become like this. And how do you get out of and, it? And we need to, the first thing is that we need to acknowledge that this is a problem. We should stop deceiving ourselves. And by the way, the debts, when they talk about uh, debt service, uh, uh, what's it called, debt sustainability, and they look at domestic debt, the domestic debt that the DMO publishes does not capture the entire debt. A few days ago, the Minister of Finance said the, the president has approved that the 20 trillion that the government owes the CBN should now be securitized. So when they are talking and about I the- And you are arguing that even yes. that is against the CBN Act. So, so let's take it one after the other. Mm. Um, when you look at the domestic debt that we talk about, that they were talking about before, before they admitted that there's this 220 trillion, the ways and means, the advances from CBN was not there. So if you had added it, so all this talk about the debt is still sustainable will be different. That is one. Two, the advances from the CBN in 2014, January 2014, was 265.7 billion naira. In 2016? In 20, 2014. 14, 2014. Right. By March this year, from this report that uh, we have here, by March this year, it had ballooned to... 18.89 trillion that increased by more than 7,000 percent within eight years. By currently, it's more than 20 trillion. So, what is the so, short so, way? I mean, what is the way out in 30 seconds? Well, so many things we need to do. One, uh, we need to generate more revenue. Uh, the debt is high. But the debt will have been manageable if we generate more money. We're not generating as much money as much money as we should as a country. Our debt to our revenue to GDP is one of the lowest in the world, if not the lowest. On that note, I think we should come to the end of this edition of the program. Thank you, Mr. Waziri Adio, the Thank you so much. Executive Director Agora Policy. I can see you have so much to do, and I do hope that those in authorities will also take in some of your advice. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Viewers, we've come to the end of this edition of 30 Minutes. Keep a date with us.